Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, <laughs> passing my uh, drink pet uh, right there. <laughs> I'm a nervous alcoholic. Yeah, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm always, I never want to, I mean, just, I don't have it in my back pocket. I mean, I, um, you know, I look back and it's, uh, it's only a miracle that I'm, you know, I'm standing upright, you know, and not laid out somewhere. And only because of this, this fellowship. Um, but I'm an alcoholic. I mean, I drank just like you. Um, you know, I, I ran into a bad, a bad run with alcohol. You know, it, uh, it took everything I had. And then it wanted more. You know, they said it was the great eraser. And, uh, I didn't know that when I took my first drink, you know. But wait a second. I want to thank Sini and everybody for letting me get up here and, uh, and ramble and, and tell my story, you know. I, uh, I, I can hear my sponsor, you know, when I start to get slick or funny, I can hear Phil just whispering, you know, get to your drinking. Get to your drinking, you know, so. Anybody new or coming back and you want to get up here and be profound and funny and all that other stuff, you know, just get to your drinking, you know, because that's, that's what got my attention. Um, and that's what touched my heart. But I'm an alcoholic. I'm, my home group is Courage to Change in the friendly village of Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, New York, baby. Um, the best home group, and um, my sober date is May something, 1983. And I say May something because I uh, I came to uh, I came to just going into Central Booking, and I remember a couple of days before that I was. Uh, uh, my family had a barbecue, right? My family had a barbecue. And they wouldn't let me into the barbecue, you know. It was my house that I paid for. <laughs> and all I wanted was, I wanted a chicken sandwich, a can of beer, and two cigarettes. And, uh, and they said, no, the kids said, mama's daddy, it's daddy, you know, like I'm some sort of monster, you know. Daddy's here, you know. He said, get the kids away, you know. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then I blacked out, and then I, but, so I always celebrate, um, God's gift around Memorial Day. And, uh, so, and, uh, but anyway, my, you know, in, in Brooklyn, uh, most of my combat was in Brooklyn. I got sober, uh, earlier in Manhattan. But my first drink was, uh, in Brooklyn, um, you know, we had a little neighborhood drink called Gypsy Rose. And, uh, hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 50 cent a pint. And I loved it because, you know, the extent of the social drinking was me and a couple of fellas asking this wino to go into the, the liquor store on Fulham Buffalo and said, get us a pint of wine. He would gladly do it in exchange for a sip of the wine, you know. But he didn't take a sip. He took Half of the bottle in one gulp. And we had to wrestle it back. And I remember my, my, I, I came of age as an alcoholic when I bought, I actually, I went into, I was tired of going to this, this bomb derelict alcoholic to get my wine. And I walked into that liquor store by myself. And I put that, them two quarters up there and said, give me a pint of Gypsy Rose. And, and he did it, you know, when I was a kid. And I took it back up to my room and I drank it. 
And I was watching TV, and I had the paper cups. I used to like the way they would drink on TV. You know, whenever anybody would come into the office, anything at all, they would drink. You know, any okay do it. And I, and, um, and I got drunk in my room, and, um, and that was it. Then I realized, I realized I could change the way that I felt for 50 cents. You know, I could go to a party, you know, uh, like uncool, didn't want to go, you know. But then, you know, I'd get like a quarter of a pint in me, and I became one of them, like, what are you looking at, drunks, you know? Like the toughest cats in the neighborhood, you know? And my buddies would say, don't mess, Joe's crazy, you know, you got that stuff in him, you know? And I, I wasn't a tough guy, but the alcohol changed me. And um, little did I know that that, that was just the start. And um, uh, it, they say it's a progressive disease. That means, simple, <laughs> it gets worse. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. That's their definition. And that's what it was for me. I uh, escalated into other things. I was a quick study in um, the other fine arts of getting high, so much so that I made my first uh, detox when I was 15 years old. And um, my mother had to sign me into this place called a place called Manhattan General, uh, Bernstein Institute. Sounds like it's a school, Bernstein Institute. <laughs> it is a, it's a locked door facility. It's not an institute. And um, it was my first, de- first of many uh, institutions that I went into. And uh, I remember in there, I was the young, I was like the mascot in the, um, in this one particular floor. I think it was the third floor. And these were like seasoned, you know, heroin addicts and alcoholics. And, and everybody had their group. Like, you know, uh, the blacks was on this side of the ward and the Latinos here. And then they had uh, these Asian fellas that were like detoxing off opium. And they were just massage each other, you know, and it it was in so much pain. It was in so much pain. And, uh, and I sat at the feet of these people and they proceeded to teach me, you know, how to succeed in this game of, you know, drinking and getting high on all of this. And, uh, uh, I ran into this one guy, I've, I've never seen him before, but his name was Romeo. He was from Harlem. And uh, he said that when we get out of this this detox, that he would teach me how to drink, and he would teach me how to set up a franchise of shooting galleries on 116th Street. <laughs> and I said, really? And he said, yeah. So um, they also had these dances with the women that were on the sixth floor. And you thought the men were hard on the third floor. But this was the beginning, this was my first um, institutional romance in a detox facility. I fell in love with this older woman, <laughs> and, uh, and we would dan- had all bathrobes, and we were dancing, <laughs> Latin, you know, we were like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was a mess. But they, but they, they, so and it, we fell in love. And I said, look, we're going to leave. You know, I had never graduated high school, but I was going to leave. I was going to, you know, take up a trade. And uh, she was going to leave with me. We didn't have to wait for a medical discharge because <laughs> I knew what the problem was, you know. And we proceeded to leave. And we got to the corner of 2nd Avenue. We saw the liquor store there. And she said, well, why don't we get a drink just to, and I said, that's right. And we got that drink, started uh, arguing and fighting on the corner. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I was in Brooklyn. And I, you know, she may be in here now. <laughs> I never thought about that. I'm serious, yeah. You know, sometimes... I, it's funny now, but sometimes, you know, you'll hear people get up, especially a lot of men, they'll get up and they'll talk about how they, you know, woke up with, you know, somebody that was 
uh, an ugly woman. Man, you better be careful. You know, there is some woman that is sharing now in AA <laughs> saying, I woke up with this ugly thing of a man, and that was you. <laughs> That's right. Listen. You know, after after that three day binge, you wake up in that hotel. You ain't and you ain't no pretty picture yourself, you know. <laughs> but um, so it didn't work out. The detox didn't work out. The romance didn't work out. You know, I I, I was 16. Um, all I knew was St. Mark's Avenue between Hopkinson and Saratoga. All I knew was you know. Uh, uh, how to drink, you know, uh, no responsibility and, and, and I just got into it deeper. Uh, you know, I went to, must have been, uh, five, six years later, uh, and I had done many other things that landed me into detoxes, uh, for many other reasons, but it must have been around, uh, I must have been about 20, 21 years old and, um, I, I, I was on like this medically assistant treatment for these other habits that I had. And I went to, uh, I was walking down the street and this ran into a, a good friend of mine and he said, well, Joe, you know, they, they have scholarships at this school. And I always wanted to go to school, but I never wanted to put in the effort. You know, I always wanted to be smart. I always wanted the results, but I didn't want to put in the footwork, you know, uh, and that, I carried that, I mean, I think I had that before I took my first drink. And the alcohol just, you know, brought that to another level. But I did go, but I, I took the alcohol with me. You know, I went back to school, I got my, uh, GED, and I, um, uh, next thing I knew, I was in college. I was in college, uh, I had a family. I knew I had a family because <laughs> when I got sober, I had these four kids that looked like me. <laughs> You know, they would come up when I, yeah, when I was in one of the programs, they would come up on family day and they would say, and then that's when I stopped, I stopped having visits. I didn't want visits. Even when I was in the penitentiary, I didn't want visits, you know, just let me do what I'm doing alone. I don't want to know what's good. This is my world and this is my reality. And I uh, continued to drink with a vengeance. You know, the school was there. The school was just the backdrop, just, you know, the context for this alcoholism, you know, just to, to grow. And it grows inside first. It's an inside job. It, alcoholism is an inside job. What you saw was the outside, but the real damage was inside. The real pain was inside. Stuff I couldn't talk about. Stuff I could only talk about uh, with, with, with another uh, alcoholic, you know, sometime in the sobriety. But I, back then I wasn't letting you know anything. And I just poured it on top of it, uh, on top of all that pain. And I did go uh, back to school. Somehow, you know, it it it, it was a game to me. Um, you know, I thought I was an intellectual, but I was still drinking wine. You know, I was still, that part of the world got too uh, tough for me. I would go back to St. Mark's Avenue. You know, finish that. And somebody said, uh, I said, well, I don't know what to do now. And I was always one to follow what somebody said. You know, uh, they would say, why don't you try this? I say, yeah, okay, <laughs> you try this. I was always, so the suggestion I had back then, well, go to law school. And, um, and I did. And to this day, you know, it was a three year haze of darting in and out of alcoholism. Um, two different worlds. I had like this double kind, this double consciousness of, of law school. And still, I was an alcoholic, you know, and I was calling out for stuff that, you know, the law school couldn't provide, you know. It didn't fill uh, the holes that I had inside, but I, I kept it up. Somehow graduated, uh, then started to make more money than I ever made in my life. I was making some money then. I mean, I was never like a hustler, real, you know, uh, you know, prime A, you know, hustler that would do stuff without drinking. You know, I knew some fellas that would get into fights and beat up people without getting high, you know. Um, 
and I had to drink to do everything. So, and that always amazed me that people could do things without drinking. I learned that in, in recovery that you could actually, you know, um, uh, enjoy music or go out and get on the floor and dance without, you know, uh, alcohol. Uh, but at that time, I was just pulled so many different ways um, that I would wake up in the morning. I would kiss the kids goodbye. They were going to school. And three days later, I'd wind up in an after-hour joint, you know, in Queens, speaking Spanish, you know. And I... <laughs> I was, when he said the AA preamble of Spanish, I was trying to recognize the words, but I mean, I wasn't speaking Spanish. I wound up in some dangerous places. Um, and I would wash up and then go back to work. At my, uh, I was in a partnership with three other guys, and they couldn't understand why on a, on a Tuesday morning, I'd be there at seven o'clock in the morning with some of these you know, dances from the after hour joint and we, the office is full of cigarette smoke and liquor, uh, and, and, and the dancers are dancing and I'm, you know, and I, my arrogance, you know, it's a defiant. This alcoholism is one of like arrogance and defiance. And they would say, what are you doing, Joe? And I would say, you mind your damn business. I know what I'm doing. You know, I'm bringing money into this thing. Um, and, and just couldn't connect. Be, I would be out for three, four days, you know, run back to the office. I would go to this place. Uh, it was downtown. I was down in Manhattan. Uh, they would open up early. I would go and buy a suit. I mean, just buy a suit. After a while, he would have, like, the suits just already made. You know, get a shirt and tie, do what I have to do, and then start it all over again. You know, but in the meantime, what I'm not talking about, I had a family as well. And I was trying to juggle the family, and the career, and the after-hour joints, and the drugs, and the alcohol, and I just, I just couldn't do it. I thought I could. I'd wake up in the morning, proceed to do it, and I, and things were just falling. Uh, uh, the, 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 I think what, the first thing was I was kicked out of the office, right? Then I was kicked out of home. And I always say when I was kicked out of home, you know, I was kicked out of the bedroom first. And then into the living room. And it wasn't that bad because, you know, <laughs> you know, it's the disease of it wasn't that bad, you know, because I'm, I'm in the living room watching TV. You know, I just didn't have to, I couldn't make a lot of noise, you know. <laughs> just me and Johnny Carson, you know, and I'm smoking a cigarette. And I said to my, you know, I said, I'm not going to make noise. And I smoking a cigarette and drink and I start laughing. And laughing, and then I say, let me put on some music, you know. <laughs> I was one of the music drunks too, you know. And, uh, and next thing I know, I'm laid out on the floor, and the kids are going to school, and, you know, and after a while, you know, my wife at that time just had enough, got the black garbage bag, and said, you know, you gotta go. And my arrogance was, you know, I told her the, the, the the, the kids, you know, when I was, I said, that's her fault. You know, that's her fault. But just like I've heard many of you say, um, when I left, it was a sense of relief because I could drink the way I wanted to. Now, this is how sick this was. I had no place to go. No money. No clothes. A black garbage bag. And I was relieved. And I'm leaving a loving family, a home, people that love me, and where the hell am I going? But I was relieved because I could finally be me and be who I am. And, you know, my story is one of, it's not a pretty story, you know, you know, I was, uh, you know, just that, as, as my sponsor says, I was a pissy, shitty drunk. Um, I had, uh, uh, wound up, uh, sleeping on the subway. Um, I did maintain, I, d I was able to still wear a shirt and tie though, you know, because, um, I always wanted to let you know 
that it wasn't that bad. You know, so if you saw me with a shirt and tie and it's seven o'clock in the morning and I smell like I've been out for four days, at least I have my shirt and tie and I'm, I'm going on to work. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine, man. So, you all right, Joe? Yeah, I'm fine. You know, I had dreads before they came into style. I had a brown raincoat. It was like one of them London fog things, but it was black at the end. I had lost my glasses. Um, yeah, and I had that briefcase. I had, <laughs> I had a briefcase. I got to remember this. I had a briefcase that was not my briefcase. <laughs> it was locked. And I never knew what was inside. But I always carried it, you know, like, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. And all I know that when I got to the end of the story, they clerked, they checked it in the property office at the receiving room. So, um, but that's the way I was. I always thought that I was better, you know, than every other bum on the train. You know, my thing, I rationalized that. I couldn't get, it wasn't that I was sleeping on the train, that I was trying to get off at my stop on the train, and I could never get off. And then the disease told me that I wasn't like the other derelicts that were laying out, taking up three and four seats on the train. My God. I was... The one that sat up straight, just taking a nap, <laughs> just taking a nap. And I think because of that defiance, I suffered even more. You know, um, they tell me years back that they, that they did have shelters. I always used to say, uh, when I first got sober, I said, they didn't have no shelters. But they did have a shelter on 3rd Street. But I wouldn't go to that shelter. was beneath me. It was, I don't even know. All I know, I guess when the train got there, I didn't have sense enough to get up to go to the shelter. But I wouldn't have went anyway. Uh, you know, my disease told me that, you know, uh, all I needed was enough money and, and just a little time and I would be all right. But that never came because while I was sleeping on that subway, I had the police looking for me. The feds were looking for me. Those Colombians out in Queens were looking for me. My wife was looking for me. The kids were looking for me. The district, the Bronx district attorney, yeah, that guy, he was looking for me. And I was on the run. Um, I don't know where I was going, but I was on the run. And I always say, you know, that in, in the middle of this degradation, I had lost my, I lost my glasses as well. And I couldn't see. And that was alright with me. You know? Cause I don't want to see what was out there anyway. And to further complicate it, I figured that with all them people looking for me, if I couldn't see them, <laughs> they couldn't see me. So, I was good. I was good up until, up until, uh, I, I was woken up, uh, arrested for something. I, I was, I was just being harassed because I was black on the train. All right, right. But then, you know, I, I laugh now, but it actually saved my life because when I got into Central Book and when things started to clear up, um, I had all these charges that fell, all these warrants and, you know, these crimes that, you know, when you get the self-righteousness, I don't remember this and I don't remember that. You know, or what's the big deal? You know, you steal money here and what's the big deal? You know, an alcoholic, I would get fired from jobs for, for stealing money or doing really bad things. And my alcoholist said, What's the big deal? Come on now. Everybody steals, you know? So, um, all of this started to fall on me and still in my arrogance, 
uh, in like the bowels of Rikers Island and that Manhattan federal place. My, my disease, it, it came to me that with all this happening that I should defend myself. Um, <laughs> because nobody really understood what I had been through. Well, I'm glad you agree, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, uh, cause they tried to appoint me some court appointment. I said, a court appointed lawyer? Do you know who I am? Do you have? <laughs> and so, and I remember, I remember the judge asking me several times. He said, Mr. Turner, are you sure you want to proceed? I said, damn right. <laughs> and I figured, well, that didn't work out too well, cause, because now my story goes to the penitentiary. <laughs> and, uh, um, I was railroaded. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You all know what I mean, what they do to us. My God. What's the big deal? So what, so what happened was, and I feel good now because that, that's the how it was, and I feel good now inside, too, because now I can see that God is starting to do his work, you know. Set the, all that alcohol, all that the penitentiary, all that the, uh, the after-hour joints, sleeping on the train, you know, my, all that was just the backdrop for him to come in and do what he does, you know, all of that stuff, all of that stuff. So I'm in the penitentiary, and for me... Life was good in the penitentiary. I say it because I was institutionalized. You know, I was able to do things in the penitentiary I wasn't able to do. I set up a law practice. I, I was, uh, I was doing like these appeals and bail reductions for mafiosa and these real bad characters. So I was protected. You know, I was the big man on campus. You know, I, 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 I had a locker full of cigarettes and the real nasty short ice magazines and the cookies and, and I would walk in the yard and, you know, people would say, uh, uh, Joe, can I say? I said, no, no, not now, now, not now. I'm busy. I got too many cases, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so, <laughs> and I said, wow, you know? <laughs> so, and all of this, it, 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 it dawned on me that I was institutionalized because life was better for me in there than it was out there. And slowly, like the faces of my children and, you know, the wife and people that love me slowly started to fade, like just as, you know, a distant thing. And I wanted this right here, you know. Get up the yard and all of this, the, you know, the, the, the espionage in the prison, all this stuff. I was like in it. I was in it, you know, I was in it. And one day, um, I say the reason that I'm in AA is because it rained. And, uh, it was rain. I, I used to bet on the softball games, you know, when our Latino brothers would play softball. And, uh, you know, I was there taking side bets and all this, but it rained one day, and I walked past uh, the law library, and I saw this guy in there, this guy with a bald head, handlebar mustache, and he's sitting in there all by himself. And I said, what is this? And the guy said, don't go in there. I said, why? He said, because they make you believe in God. I said, okay, I won't go in there, you know. <laughs> and uh so I took suggestions. <laughs> right. Don't do that. Okay, I won't do that. Right. So one day, I walked past, and he walked in, and he, he had um, uh, about two or three women that were also sitting at the table. He had all these books and everything, and there were a couple of guys there from uh, uh, that I knew. Uh, but these were like goody-goody guys. I didn't hang out too much with them, but they were in there. But I saw the women, and I went inside. Um and it started to talk, and I said, what is this? And uh, to make a long story short, you know, he came to me at the end, and oh, and I would raise my, I raised my hand at my first meeting, I said, yeah, I said, I said, yeah, I said, my name is Joe, and um, 
I can see how this alcohol has wreaked such havoc on you, you know? And I'm sorry you're doing this. And, you know, Sonny would look, and he would look. I think he brought some of them, some of them strong AA women from Harlem with him, right? Because they looked, and he would say, like, and Sonny would say, yeah, he's, he's mine, you know? <laughs> and I would say, and I thought they were agreeing with me, you know? And, but he told me, I, I did show up again, because there was something about that, that atmosphere, you know, it was like an island and all. It was something about it. I went back and Sonny told me, uh, his story. It wasn't, it was like after me. And I said to myself, Oh my God, you know, and I was thought he was making it up because I hadn't told him anything about me, you know, just, and then I remember him saying, look, you don't have to take the elevator all the way to the bottom. You can get off anytime you want. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I'll be back again next Saturday. And, you know, when they would have uh, the AA meetings on Saturday, the time would compete with Soul Train. And everything in the penitentiary stopped for Soul Train. So they could see him go down the line, you know. So I, I broke away from Soul Train to go save my life. And um, it was the first, my first exposure uh, to AA. And, you know, God brought me to AA, and then AA brought me back to God. I remember Sonny sitting down and talking to me, and every time I tried to tell him about this happened and that happened, he said, it don't matter, Joe. He said, he said AA can bring you from, from that to this. And I said, well, what is this? He said, look, you know, uh, I'm coming in here, bringing the meeting day in, I mean, uh, uh, weekend in and weekend out. You show up. Something is happening. Something is happening. And I, I, I didn't trust them. You know, we had a meeting today about trust. It was as Bill sees it. I didn't, I didn't trust God. I didn't even trust myself. But it was something about this individual. You know, he spoke the truth, and he spoke the truth without blame or judgment. And then... Um, uh, when, when, when we would talk and the meetings would begin to get populated, you know, I think, uh, I knew I took that first step, um, when I began to talk at least somewhat honestly about my drinking. Um, and I formed a bond with him. I didn't stay in there, uh, obviously I wanted to, but I didn't stay in there the rest of my life. And, you know, when you get released, you gotta go, you have to have an address. You gotta have a address. So this man let me live with him. He didn't know me from Adam. I mean, I'm from Brooklyn. He's from Harlem. He's an ex-cop, an ex-lawyer, you know. He, he didn't trust me. And I remember going to live with him. And I remember he had up in his closet, um, he had a 38 revolver. And he said, he said, so-and-so, he said, if you will steal from me, he said, you want to be introduced to my best friend. <laughs> and I said, I said, you and AA, you can't talk like that. He said, yeah. And, um, and it was the beginning of, of, of the beginning. You know, um, I thought I had lost everything, had nothing, but when I came into AA, I realized that I had gained everything. And I started making early meetings in Harlem, um, uh, Principles before personalities and, you know, some of them strong folks up there, Dollar Bill and Lois and Goat and all of them, all of them impressed me. And I like the fellas like Goat because, you know, on the one hand, he was like a real gangster guy, but so spiritual. God would come out two sentences after shooting somebody, you know. <laughs> wow. How you do that? Yeah. <laughs> how you do God and homicide, you know. So, but I, I didn't stay in Harlem, uh, long because, you know, Sonny believed in doing work. We got into the steps. Actually, when I was locked up, I was on my knees immediately with that third step. Then when we got out, stayed with him for a while, and it wasn't so much suggestions back then. He said, look, if you don't do the ninth step, you will drink and you will die. I said, okay. And the ninth step, I had to go back to Brooklyn and see these 
this family that had long, uh, long left and abandoned. I hadn't seen my kids in years. And I said, I said, I said, okay, I'll go back to the house. I'll, but if you go with me and like be my witness, let them know that I'm okay now. And he said, yeah, I'll do that, Joe. Yeah, come on. Uh, you know, so we got on the train, you know, and got off at the stop. And I'm saying, Sonny, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. We got right to the door. No, just a little bit before the door. And I see him peel and turn and walk away. I said, where are you going? He said, what are you, a punk? I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> and I said, come with and ring the bell. He didn't ring the bell. You know, I rang the bell. You know, they talk about the promises and, you know, just showing up. I don't know where I got the courage just to stay there and not just run down the stoop and run around the corner, but it came out of nowhere. And that was the beginning of many times God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. It was the beginning of many times of, of God showing up when I wanted to go the other way. And it was the beginning of many times of God dragging me, like kicking and screaming. I wanted to go this way. But he brought me to, to a better place. Um, so my sober date um, is May 1983. Um, everything that I've lost, that I needed in AA, I've gotten back. You know, I was disbarred as an attorney. They took that. They took it. They really didn't take it. I drank it away. It's not no they. It wasn't no conspiracy. I am responsible. I drank it away. You know, so um and that for many, many years that 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 was on me. And what I did, I got into I got into another career, um uh service, immersed in AA, but it was still in the back of my mind that, you know, I'm one of the first in my family ever to graduate, you know, from from college. When I graduated from law school, folk came up from down south. From down south. And uh you know, I was talking to, I had talked to Sonny before he passed about this and, but never, seriously, some folks in my home group, but, um, it was about a year ago, I decided that I wanted to trust God in this process and, you know, reapply for readmission. You know, I said, and you know how I'm scared doing it, but I won't tell you that I'm scared. You know, I won't say that. They may say no. You know, I said, I told you this is all BS, you know, and, um, but with some good, strong people in my life, you know, uh, I did that. I did make that application. And um, on Tuesday, this Tuesday at 1230, uh, I have to go um, to the appellate division, first department, and begin that process of readmission, you know. So... But, you know, but the real blessing was AA. You know, I'm still a little scared. Man, if I could have all y'all with me next Tuesday, <laughs> just a bust in that office, man. I say, what's up with Joe, man? <laughs> He's a good guy. But it is what it is. If I get it, I get it. But if I don't, I have y'all. And I got, I got grandkids today. You know, I heard somebody say, yeah, I got grandkids and I see them by appointment only. You know, they live down south and I'm always going down south. I, you know, I have good people in my life that I love today. You know, they love me without condition, not just what they can get. You know, these promises have come true in my life for an alcoholic that was sleeping on train, lost everything. I didn't even tell you about my suicide attempts. That didn't work out because God didn't work, want him to work out. He knew. So it was almost like saying way down the road, you know, of where you be in a convention on a Sunday, out of the crack house, out of the dope house, you know, not waiting for the liquor store to open on Sunday. We waiting for the meeting to open on a Sunday, you know. So I'm thankful, forever thankful for Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, who's it's given me a second chance on life. And I'm thankful for all of you. Uh, some folks I know I, I don't know, just friends not, we are, we are good friends, just haven't met yet. Um, I want to thank Sini for this convention. You didn't fall asleep, Pat. <laughs> all right. 
And I want to thank you all of you. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.